a gorgeous young mom, just 33, goes on a cross-country trip. How do you just disappear, vanish into thin air? Her family keeping up with her as she goes, but now the big, big question, where is Katie? But right now, we have a major clue. I'm Nancy Grace. This is Crime Stories. Thank you for being with us here at Crime Stories and on Sirius XM 111. First of all, take a listen to this. During the drive, Adam Avalis, Katie Ferguson, and their girls draw the attention of Arkansas police. A slight drizzle trickles as the family sit in the parking lot with the front passenger door open of their Dodge Durango. At 11 a.m., a Truman, Arkansas police officer startles Katie as she approaches the car. Katie can be seen in the body cam footage folding baby clothes. A toddler climbs in the front seat area between her parents. The officer asks how they are doing. Katie Ferguson tells the officer they are a bit tired, but when the officer asks to see some ID, Katie says hers is in a bag in the back. Adam Avila starts asking questions. Did someone call the police on them? Is Arkansas an ID state? Avelis bristles at being asked for ID. He tells the officer they aren't doing anything wrong. And here comes the clue. Just before Katie seemingly vanishes, and remember that the cop approaches them, not because they did anything wrong, but because he sees the car part with the door open. So he walks over, and there is Katie, perfectly fine, uh, the baby in the car, folding up baby clothes. And he's asking, hey, what's going on? Why is your door open? And we have the body cam footage. We can see her. We can hear her. I want you to see it and hear it with me. Take a listen. How you guys doing? Oh, okay. What you guys up to? Uh, no, Say it again. Try to clean up and head over to Jonesboro. How are you doing? Okay. Well, I was just seeing a door open and looked suspicious, so I had to come uh, check it out. Yeah, we're going back. So are you guys out of Wyoming? or? Yeah, yeah we're going back. You went back? Oh, yeah. Do you guys have an ID or anything? Yeah. Yeah. Is Arkansas an ID state? Yeah, I can't tell you how many times uh, when I was in the district attorney's office, I'll be riding along to find a witness or whatever, and a cop will ask somebody for an ID, and the first thing they say is, why? They don't just get out the ID and show it. They always say, why? Um, and, of course, in America, you can do that. You know, you go to Russia or China, and you get clubbed. But uh, here, you say, why do you want my ID? And that's what he did. But as you can hear... The children are in the car playing. Everything's fine. She's sitting in the front seat folding baby clothes. We see her. We hear her. All is well. Listen to this. Say it again. Is it an ID state? Well, I, I just need to verify you. Okay. Well, I mean, it is a suspicious vehicle in the parking lot, so. Someone called in or you go through? I was driving right here and I seen you guys. No so. Okay. Yeah, then I won't. If it's not, if Arkansas isn't a must-ID Do you have your ID on you? Um, I, I don't, I know your wallet is right second. What's your name? Catherine. Catherine. Um, Ferguson. Catherine. Ferguson. Ferguson? Yeah. Out of Wyoming? Okay. Let me say. Well, he's right. This is her boyfriend talking. Uh, he's right. Uh, joining me is Katie's mother, Mona Hartling, and her brother who contacted us on Facebook about his missing sister, Alan Ferguson. But first to James Shellnut, high-profile lawyer out of Alabama. Uh, 27 years, Metro major case, including SWAT, now the lead at the Shellnut Law Firm. James Shellnut, now remember... We're not in L1, crim law. Just give me a yes, no. Under U.S. v. Terry, cops can stop and ask for ID. If they see anything, 
suspicious. And I'm telling you what, if they didn't ask for ID, we'd all be three inches up their tailpipe right now because you've got two children in the car. You've got a guy who doesn't want to show you his ID. You've got a woman who says, yeah, it's in the back in one of those bags. The cop is not going to go through the diaper bag looking for the ID. But when you have children in the car, you have to find out why are you pulled over? Who are these children? Are they your children? What's happening? There's nothing wrong with what the cop did. There's absolutely nothing wrong with what he did. He did exactly what he was supposed to do. He was investigating a suspicious situation, uh, and he did exactly what protocol is, probably followed his policy, followed the law. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Guys, we've got more body cam footage, and the, it, it's not relevant, really, about their ID or why they were had the door open. They obviously were taking a breather from driving and folding clothes and getting the children situated. What I'm looking at is her. Her. It's all I care about. Her, Katie, what is her demeanor? Does she look like she's in any danger? Is there some problem? Uh, we've got one more little bit of body cam. Let's look at it. How long have you guys been here in Truman? Just one night, yeah. You guys just passing through? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, an officer um, came to the dollar store. So what are you guys doing over oh my, in this area? I'm at, like traveling this way. You guys family or? Uh, yeah. Well, no, no. I was down in Alabama. Yeah. Say it again. I was with my family and then he came up. Where's your family? In Jonesboro? No, 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 no. It's all the way like way down like towards Florida and stuff. And his, um, I, I took the girls for a while and we separated for a while and then we came back together so he drove down to see me and we decided to get back together and take care of the girls. So. Gotcha. This is just away from Cody Watts. Okay. Uh, Alabama. Yeah, I know. I don't want to be here. So All right. Can't finish that either. All right. Uh, a cop says, all right, and walks away. And, you know, I heard one thing. I don't know if you could hear it, but I have the transcription, so it was easier for me to hear it. Um, uh, and I would always do that with juries. Whenever there's anything they're supposed to hear, like a tape recording, and there's not an audio visual or they can't see it, I always do a transcription uh, so they can read it as they're hearing it. Uh, the cop says exactly, uh, the boyfriend says it's away from Cody, and Katie Ferguson says, I don't want to be here. I find that really interesting. Okay, joining me, uh, Mona Hartling, this is Katie's mother, who has led uh, an insane, desperate search to find her daughter. Alan Ferguson is her brother who first alerted us to her disappearance. Miss Hartling, thank you for being with us. Did you know that your daughter was thank going, you. yes, ma'am, on this trip with the boyfriend um, and the children? Did you know they were heading across country? I did. What did she I tell didn't you? Know. Why did they uh, decide to take the trip? Um, it's the cycle of abuse. Um, we came down here to start afresh, me and the babies and Katie to get away from Adam. Um, we were in a safe house in Powell, Wyoming, which is next to Cody. Um, once we left the safe house, we saw him everywhere we went in Cody, Wyoming. So we started fresh down here in Alabama. Um, we were down here a few months and just the cycle of abuse is why I believe she reached out to Adam. Um, and the three-year-old at the time, she was three, wanted to talk to daddy. And Got I believe it. that's how it just started. Wanted daddy. I understand. Joining me, an all-star panel in addition to Katie's mother and brother, Alan Ferguson, Katie's brother. When did you first realize Katie was missing? Um, you know, we hadn't talked in about maybe a month or so. And uh, my mom had called me um, basically saying, you know, I'm worried about your sister we haven't heard from her. Uh, I continued. So I got on Instagram and Snapchat and that's how we normally talk. And so I like, kept messaging her over and over and over and messaged her on Facebook and tried to call her a thousand times and, uh, and nothing happened. And eventually, um, I was getting off work and I got a, 
texts from my mom that said I had to report Katie missing. And uh, uh, for some reason in my gut, uh, right then I just knew because Adam, um, when I was over and back in Wyoming uh, at Adam and Katie's house, I I had been privy to plenty of times where Adam had been screaming at Katie and you know, he's he's told her many of times that uh, you know, he wanted to dispose of her and take the kids and I would be there to stand up for her. My mom would be there and uh it was just a cycle of the same thing over and over and I would tell her to leave. Uh but during that moment when my mom texted me that I, I just knew deep down that um something was seriously wrong. Um Hold on just a second. I want to circle back to that moment. You're telling me what has led up to this moment. But when they were pulled over with the door open in the parking lot, well, they weren't pulled over. When the cop approached their car in Arkansas, in Truman, Arkansas, um, when he saw that car door open, we see her, we hear her, and Everything is seemingly fine. Joining me right now, a longtime colleague and who I consider a friend, Chris Adams, also known as the Turtle Man. He is a survival expert, and I believe this guy. As a matter of fact, I took the twins, my children, down to see the Okefenokee, one of the biggest swamps in the world. And Chris Adams, I trusted him. And I got on the boat with him and the children, and we went through the swamp, and we hadn't been out there 40 minutes. Excuse me, hadn't been out there five minutes before we saw 40 gators coming up from the water. That's how much I believe in this guy. Um, Chris Adams, a.k.a. Turtle Man, on Facebook, Wiregrass Ecological and Cultural Project on TikTok, at Georgia Turtle Man. Chris, thank you for being with us. This terrain... You know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but I've had it happen with plenty, plenty of people. I can't even count them. They're in a car with their loved one, and they get into an argument. And children, although they've changed my world, as I've told you, Chris, you put the children in the car, you're on a long trip, they're crying, they're playing, they're hungry. You get into a fight with the spouse or the partner, and things escalate. Very often somebody gets out and storms off. It happens. Did it happen here? Maybe it started that way. I don't know that. I've got a lot of theories on what happened, but I want to talk about the terrain. Was she pushed out of the car? Was she forced out of the car? Did she get out of the car there? How could anyone survive at that time, November, in those conditions, what can you tell me? Would you have to be an expert like you, or could a regular civilian go out and live? I think it all depends on the scenario itself and where they actually got out of the car. We know that she was last seen in Truman, Arkansas, but going from there, uh, I believe I heard mentioned possibly to Texarkana. They were going that way, yes. That's the way they were headed. That That's hilly country through there. Very hilly country. And, of course, you've got pine barrens. You've got large stands of oak and oak savanna, grassland areas, hilly, rocky. And there are rivers and creeks that go through there. As with any environment, one has to be careful where they actually walk through to avoid stepping in a hole, twisting an ankle, something like that. And depending on the terrain, whether it's easy or hard to navigate will determine whether a person can survive there long term. And being that they were off of a major highway at some point or byway, normally you would be near some sort of civilization, people living there, housing community, farms. So it's not like we just think that she's out there in a wilderness area, perhaps. I don't think there's enough information circulating around for me to determine that myself. I agree, but certainly between Truman, Arkansas and Texarkana, there's a lot of wide open spaces. Oh, absolutely. Now, it's absolutely. not the swamp, of course, but the terrain you were describing, that's what I'm thinking about because 
best case scenario right now, she stomped out of the car. Do I think that happened? Probably not, because she would not leave those children. If she left, she'd take them with her. Unless she got into an argument, likely started by him, but got into an argument, and she got out of the car, and he takes off before she could get the children. Or they get in an argument, and he puts her out of the car, or hits her. I, I don't know. There's a million ways this could have gone down. Was she injured when she got out of the car? Was she dumped somewhere? But how long could you survive? She hasn't turned up in anybody's home. Average temps, Arkansas, high 40s to 70s. Could she have survived? There's been no report of her approaching someone's home, hospital, shelter, nothing. So for all I know, she's in the wilderness. I don't know where she is. She could be down a ravine. She could be anywhere. How could she live, Chris Adams? Well, this goes back to several cases I've been on you with now, and I always, this may sound like my go-to line, but hypothermia is always a real risk. It doesn't matter if it's 80 degrees outside or if it dips down into just above freezing temperatures. If the body has moisture on it, if the air has moisture in it and temperatures drop or your body temperature drops, one can suffer from hypothermia. And as far as foraging foods and things, most of the, the woodland trees are, have dropped their mass this time of year. There's no acorns. There's nothing you can forage like that. And, and most people who don't have that experience don't know to look for those things. And that's just the reality of the situation here. I'm looking at her in the car the last time she was seen alive, and she's got on shorts and a T-shirt. So Not conducive for this type of terrain at all. And I think she's got on socks. Socks, shorts, and a T-shirt. And like, you know, everybody that's got children in the car, the car is a jumble. Nobody knows where anything is. It's a big confusion. They're in the back seat playing and crying and trying to get into the front seat. Like everybody's car when you have children in the back seat. Um, I'm just trying to figure out, Chris Adams, how, how she could make it. Um, again, to Mona Hartling, this is Katie, Catherine Ferguson, a.k.a. Katie's mother. When was the last time you actually spoke to her verbally? I spoke to her. Um, I had the baby for a couple of weeks. I was living with both of them for a while. Adam and Katie, when he first came down. And I had Everly for a couple of weeks. Um, so it was the end of, I want to say, August, beginning of September. Mm -hmm. It was like the 5th or 6th, of se around there, of September. And she was mad at me because I didn't want to go with them. I was always for her and with her. So we know that Katie is alive and well October 5. October 5, there in Truman, Arkansas. We see her. She's fine. She's speaking to cops. How did we get here? How are these two, who obviously have a very volatile relationship, how are they in the car with children going cross country? Take a listen to our cut four. For eight years, Katie Ferguson and Adam Avalis had an on-again, off-again relationship. Living in Wyoming, they share two daughters, both under five years old. Katie and Adam separate. Adam stays in Cody, Wyoming. Katie and the girls move in with Ferguson's mother, Mana Hartling, in Dothan, Alabama. After spending the summer with her mother, Katie Ferguson wants the girls to have time with their dad. Katie Ferguson tells her family Adam has really grown up during their four-month separation. Adam starts the round-trip drive from Wyoming to pick up Katie and the girls. That is how these two end up in the car together. Adam Avilas decides to go at her request to get Katie and the girls. And he starts a round trip drive from Wyoming to pick them up. That is how they end up in the car together. Um, it's eerily reminiscent of another case. I think you all are familiar with the case of Gabby Petito. Take a listen to Our Cut 21. 
How's it going? How are you doing? Good. Hey, we got a call about a male hitting a female and the two of them getting in this vehicle and taking off. So I, it was, I, 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 I just, I don't want to try and defend myself by saying anything here, but I pushed her away. She, she gets really worked up, and when she does, she swings and she had her cell phone in her hand, so I was just trying to yeah. push her away. But, um, but, yeah, we to talk about parents, Harry. And more in 24. I told him to drive and get water because I'm getting thirsty. Yeah? Is there something on your cheek here? Looks like, did, did you get, did you get hit in the face? Um. Kind of looks like something like hit you in the face. I don't and then over on your arm, um, your shoulder, right here. There's, that's new, huh? It's kind of a new mark. Oh yeah, I don't know. Can I see the other side of your face? So, what happened here and here? Um, I, I'm not sure it was a... So the backpack got gotcha. you? I just wonder if that Truman, Arkansas cop suspected abuse. He spoke to both of them. He looked in the car. He asked for ID. He asked her, is everything okay? What's happening? Where are you from? Where are you going? But there was nothing he could hang his hat on. And Gabby Petito, there was. Two witnesses had seen Brian Laundrie beating her in the face. You heard earlier our friend Chris Adams, Turtle Man, talking about other cases we've worked on together. That's one of them. He was seen beating her in the face, yet they told him he had done nothing wrong within hours Gabby was dead. Did this cop in Truman, Arkansas have a sixth sense? You'll see what I mean. Take a listen to our Cut 7 Crime Online, Rachel Bonilla. Four days after the police encounter in Truman, Arkansas, the Dodge Durango with Adam Avalis behind the wheel is captured by a Texas DPS patrol camera. Two things are noticeably different from the previous police encounter. Katie Ferguson is not in the vehicle, and there's a projectile hole in the front passenger side door concealed with tape. Body cam footage from Arkansas clearly shows there is no hole in the passenger side door. The front passenger seat of the car has a pile of clothes on it. Two days later, Avelis is stopped again, this time by Colorado State Police. And, just as in Texas, Adam Avelis and the two girls are present, but Katie Ferguson is missing. Back to you, Chris Adams. It reminds me so much of the Gabby Petito case. Remember, Brian Laundry crosses the country in Gabby's vehicle using her credit card and her cell phone and gets all the way back to Florida to his mommy's house. And then they go on a camping trip with mommy, daddy, and sister. What nobody notices, Gabby's not there. Everything's there but Gabby. Is that ringing a bell? Chris Adams, remember when we just went through the whole thing with Gabby? The answers we need aren't coming forth. And what we assume is that she went missing somewhere between Truman, Arkansas, and somewhere near the Texas line. So my question to you, between Truman, Arkansas, and the Texas line, what's the terrain? The she terrain, lived. like I said, is very hilly. But what I just was thinking about, deer season is in in the southern Arkansas zones. There are plenty of outdoorsmen out in the woods. Any sign of something different, any person walking through the woods in those places near those major highways would be on some sort of a trail camera. There would be some evidence left behind. There are thousands of people in the woods right now in Arkansas, Texas, Oklahoma, that whole area. So something amiss would be spotted very quickly. I think you're right about that, Chris Adams. Blatant. Nicole Parton joining me, CrimeOnline.com investigative reporter. Nicole, thank you for being with us. I got to make sense of what I have just heard, uh, what Chris has told me, but also what Rachel Bonilla is reporting. Four days after the police encounter in Truman, Arkansas, Adams Dodge Durango is captured by the Texas patrol camera. Two things very different. Now, that could be a toll booth. That could be uh, a red light cam. It could be any number of cameras. Two things very different. Number one, Katie is not 
in the vehicle. The body cam footage in Arkansas shows a very different scenario. The front passenger seat has a pile of clothes on it. The next time he stopped in Colorado, just like Texas, Adam, Avilas, and the two girls are present, but no Katie. So she's not present in Texas on cam. She's not present in Colorado. So somewhere between Truman, Arkansas, and Texas, she goes missing. Also important, what am I hearing, Nicole Parton, about a projectile hole in the front passenger door concealed with tape? Right. So we know in that October footage, you've seen it, I've seen it, there's no hole in the door. We can see the door. And then the next time we have any footage whatsoever, we can see um, there's a hole in the passenger door and it's taped up now, we're being told. So here's a hole, mm -hmm. someone trying to conceal the hole and tape it up. And then we also, interesting, there's a large heap of clothing covering the passenger seat. So now we know there's clothing, we see that in the first footage, but now the whole seat is piled high, a heap, a pile of clothing in that passenger seat. Is that to hide something in the seat? Well, Is I don't know. Katie? How many children do you have? Ten. Okay. There's any number of reasons that all the children's clothes are piled in the front seat. If you look to so my true. minivan right now, you would see the entire front passenger floor is full of children's clothing. Um, but there's more. I want you to hear this, and this has knocked me off my feet. Take a listen again to Rachel Bonilla. Adam Avelis and his two daughters arrive in Wyoming. They move into his father's house. He has his two girls, but Katie Ferguson is not with them. After several days of not hearing from Katie, her mother calls the Parks County Sheriff's Office in Wyoming and reports her daughter missing. The last known time Ferguson was seen was October 5th in Arkansas. That was the same day the couple was approached in the parking lot by police. Mona Hartling, this is Katie's mother and Alan Ferguson, her brother, who is beside, they're both beside themselves and contacted me on Facebook. Mona, tell me what, what led you to call police? What happened that made you contact them and report her missing? I mean, he shows up, he moves into his dad's house with the children without her. Nobody noticed she was gone. No, nobody. He didn't tell anybody that she was missing. He didn't contact the police. He didn't contact both her sisters live there in Cody where he's at. He contacted he nobody. Alan? Oh, I'm sorry. I just say he didn't even report his uh, the one-year-old's burns. She had second and third degree burns on her, and he kept those hit so that he yes. didn't have to take her to the hospital or report it to the police. When was that? He kept the burns hid when he got back from um, his mother, Stacy. Uh, she has the, the grandbabies. They are safe. She's a wonderful grandmother. But when I called and had the police uh, involved right away, I also said those kids need to be took away from him. And they did. Within two days, they took the babies away. No, um, poor baby had burns all over her body. And the grandmother saw the burns right away. He had kept them hidden from her. How did the baby get burns? Uh, um, they asked the four-year-old, and Harlow, and she said that Everly fell in the campfire. So campfire. they've been camping. Yes, they've been camping along the way. Okay, that's telling me a lot. And the baby Everly fell into the campfire. Everly is one daughter. Harlow is four, is my understanding. Um, yes. Okay, that is changing things. Uh, Chris she can't Adams, even walk yet. Chris Adams with me, survival expert. That tells me, as I suspected, that they actually camped out on this trip. I don't know that that was intended, but the one-year-old falls into the campfire. So they, she is out there. So there again, with lack of details, we don't know where out there is. We can assume that it is somewhere off of a major highway, be it a national park, historic site, state park. 
but we don't know which one. We don't know what the terrain there was, and we simply don't even begin to know where to look for them unless anybody has an idea of where they stayed at. Mona Hartling, you've just heard from police and they tell you they've got the phone records, right? Yes. That should tell us where her phone last pinged. Have they told you that yet? No. They were, uh, the detective was going over it with got it. the FBI. Also joining me, renowned in his field, former detective Justin Boardman, Utah West Valley PD, Special Victims Unit, now Boardman Training and Consulting. You know what I don't like, Justin? So many things. But the fact that um, he shows up and doesn't tell Mona or Alan or anyone in Katie's family, hey, Katie didn't make the trip back. Nothing. He just shows up and moves in to his dad's house? Yeah, that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, that that bothers me as well. Uh, but also what bothers me is a one-year-old that has burns, especially if the one-year-old's not able to walk yet. Um, how did it end up in a campfire? Um, was there a struggle? Was there, you know, that sort of thing? Well, along that line, Justin Boardman, and you should know with all the cases you've handled, if a child gets burned at a campfire, you go at least to a dock in the box at the very least, you know, a, a little emergency Absolutely. clinic. So why would Absolutely. you choose not to go to the ER or the dock in a box? Why? I've had Because s- you're hiding something. Exactly, Justin. I'm, I'm just thinking, and Justin, please jump in whenever you have a thought. You've seen these scenarios so many times. Also joining me, Dr. Sherry Schwartz, forensic psychologist specializing in victim advocacy, She's at panthermitigation.com, and on Twitter, she's at trial doc, at trial doc, author of Criminal Behavior and Where Law and Psychology Intersect. Dr. Sherry, I want you to hear this. Take a listen to investigative reporter Jackie Howard. Katie Ferguson missed her youngest daughter's first birthday. Family members say she is not one to hide, and she wouldn't willingly stop talking to family. But that's not what Adam Avales is telling police. Speaking to cops November 8th, he reportedly told officers that Katie was not missing, but she just does not want contact with her mother. And there's more being said. The Cowboy State Daily reports during an interview with the children, one of the girls tells investigators that the father accidentally hurt her mother. You know, that's reminding me of Dr. Sherry Schwartz, and we've discussed this together before. The case of Susan Powell, who the husband, uh, Josh Powell, wakes up his little boys, I think ages two and four, and takes the whole family on a camping trip at midnight in the snow. When they were later asked about where's mommy, one of them draws a picture with mommy in the car trunk. And the other tells investigators, mommy's in the crystal mines. Okay. Now we've got a child stating daddy accidentally hurt mommy. So how does a child know how to say accidentally hurt? Uh, I'm just very curious, Dr. Sherry Schwartz. Right. Well, my, my educated guess is that daddy said it was an accident. And if anybody asked, it was an accident. Daddy didn't mean to do it, right? And at four years old, you are, you are completely at the mercy of the adults around you, particularly if daddy is scary and does scary things, right? So if daddy says, this is what happened, that's what you're going to say happened. I don't think the child's lying. I think the child believes daddy because this is her daddy and why would he lie to her? Just like Daddy, Josh Powell said, Mommy's in the crystal mines. You know, I I just want to be very clear from everything I know about this family and about Katie, there's no way she would have left her children. No way. She's left her children before one time for a couple of weeks with her mother. Her mother. And joining me right now is Katie's mother and brother. And they are asking, and I am asking for your help in finding 
Katie. The tip line is 307-527-8710. Repeat, 307-527-8710. And I want to go back to Katie's mother, uh, Mona Hartling, and her brother, Alan Ferguson. Mona, has she ever missed the children's birthdays? No, never. And Everly, this was her first birthday. She would never miss a birthday. She would never walk away like this. That was her first birthday? Yes. Yes. Has she ever abandoned the children before, ever? No, she does not. She's a good mom. All she ever wanted to be was a mother. That's all she ever wanted to be. Those babies are her heart. Is that why she got back with Avila? Because the babies want a daddy? They want to talk to daddy? I believe so. I believe so. You know, it's the just... Youngest, a, the youngest yes, what? Never even met her father. We had the baby since... Um, she, uh, Katie was with me and we were in the safe house when the baby was born. Why were you in a safe house? Because of him. Why? What did he do to make you go into just, hiding in a safe house with Katie? He, the abuse got too bad. What abuse? It was physical and mental. When you say physical, what exactly do you mean? He had jumped on her, choked her out when she was pregnant, left marks on her arms, big, big bruises. She would never report it. Why? These girls out there have to report this. Why did she not report it? I believe fear. It's an fear. abuse cycle. The abuse cycle where you want it to be like the Hallmark card and you believe it to be and you want the man, and typically it is the man, to be the person you thought you married or you thought you had children with and you believe it so much you're ready to stake everything on it, including your life. You mean that cycle? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. It takes up to uh, seven times for an abuse victim to finally leave their um, abuser, and sometimes that doesn't even happen. Dr. Sherry Schwartz, how is it, and I, I not only prosecuted domestic homicides and aggravated assaults more than I can count, I worked at the Battered Women's Center for nine years on the hotline. Dr. Sherry Schwartz, how is it that we, particularly women, have this in our heads so strongly, and we want that nuclear family to be perfect, that we are willing to suspend disbelief and continue in an abusive relationship. How does this happen? Well, I, there's a number of reasons. I mean, th there's a very complex uh, concept that I'll make very simple called a trauma bond. And basically, when, when it's really good, the relationship, it's the best ever right? And all of your positive emotions and, and positive hormones are flowing. And when it's really bad, it's bad. But you know that that is followed up by the really good. And so the really good positively reinforces the bad because you know the good is coming. But there's other factors as well. I mean, one of the most basic is you love this person. You want to believe the best of them. You want your children to have their father, their, you know, their uh, other parent in their life. You may have money issues, so you can't leave that person. So there are so many factors. And Alan is absolutely correct. It takes five to seven times. And when a victim is trying to leave their abuser, as you know, Nancy, as a prosecutor, that is the most dangerous time for them. And I heard Mona Hartling, her mother, say that he, quote, choked her out when she was pregnant. The number one cause of death of pregnant women, and I couldn't believe this when I heard it. I had to look it up in the New England Journal um, of Medicine is homicide. Number one cause of death of pregnant women is homicide. I thought it would be a stroke or a heart attack or something to do with the pregnancy itself. No, it's not. And I couldn't believe it until I looked it up myself. Well, the very best of the relationship and the very worst of the relationship. Take a listen to our cut 11, Sydney Sumner, Crime Online. 
On November 4th, someone reports Adam Avila's Dodge Durango as abandoned in Park County. Deputies investigate and find not only has the front passenger seat been removed, there is a projectile hole through the passenger door. Officers find a loaded Glock 45 pistol magazine and Clorox wipes. They say the car smells of putrefied blood. As deputies are still investigating, Adam Aviles walks up to the car with a gas can, telling deputies the Durango ran out of gas and was inoperable. Nicole Parton, do I understand this correctly? A projectile hole through the passenger door, a loaded Glock 45 pistol mag, and Clorox wipes, and the car smells, according to police, like putrefied blood. Right, that's correct. And the front passenger seat is missing. The seat's not even in the truck anymore. It's missing. Also, it's reported that there were clothes and, and rags that were covered in blood and a lot of cleaning supplies in the back of the truck. It is hearkening back, harkens me back to the case of missing mom of five from Connecticut, Jennifer Dulos. When cops finally get a hold of the car that her husband, Fotis Dulos, had borrowed, the back seat had been removed and replaced with a different type of back seat. Let me go now to Mom Mona Hartling and brother Alan Ferguson. Alan, what do you think has happened? I truly believe that uh, he has done something to her with the evidence they have so far. And we know the blood has came back as human blood. We don't have the DNA test back, but we do know it's human blood. Um, I just, me and my sister were very close. We, uh, Me and uh, Katie were raised by my mother and my other two sisters were raised by my father. And uh, so we were just always very, very close. And um, it's weird, I can't explain it, but the moment I heard about it, I just knew that uh, she wasn't with us. It's not that I don't want to give up hope or um, anything like that. Um, it's just something that you can feel. And um, then when the evidence came out more and more, um, I do believe that uh, he did something with her. Um, I believe the fire has something to do with it. I believe that he possibly disposed of her in some way. Um, I they believe also in found... water. What, Mona? I believe it was he, he disposed of her in water. Why do you think that? Um, mother's gut instinct. And my son also is We've had dreams. I know that sounds kind of ridiculous. It but doesn't sound ridiculous to me at all. Dreams yes. of her coming up. Wait, dreams of what? Her coming up out of a riverbank, not a sandy spot, a riverbank, and walking on a dirt path. And there's a campfire. Um, and she, her arms are open, and she's just coming to me over and over. Mom. Mom, mom, and she's deceased, and there's like moss in her hair. And uh, yeah, I believe he he did something. My son has also had dreams. I don't, she's not with us anymore. Yeah, he's definitely, um, she's, I, I truly believe she's no longer with us. Um, I also, the uh, want people just to know how much of a beautiful person she was and how goofy she was and how amazing and sweet and kind. Yes. But, you know, she's not just another domestic uh, violence victim. She, she was a real person. and She was such a beautiful, kind person. And just, uh, just a really, really amazing sister. She um, was a mother. She was a sister. She was a daughter. She was an auntie. There's a hole inside that will never be replaced. And I want I'm... women to know. I want women to know they can get out of it. 
I've been through it yes. too. They can get out of it. They There's can get hope. out. There is hope. You just have to make the step forward and leave and go somewhere safe. You are hearing you are hearing Katie's mother, Mona Hartling, and her brother, Alan Ferguson. And I agree with them. I think that, as they put it, Katie is no longer with us. But what we can do for them now is seek justice by God. The tip line is 307-527-8710. Please help us bring Katie home. Goodbye, friend. Guys, thank you for watching Crime Online with Nancy Grace here on YouTube. To get the very latest, subscribe to Crime Online here.